Thanks, man. How you doing? Doing all right? Thank you. Do you? Oh, he's got shirt. Hey, how are you, sir? Good. Hey, good morning. Good morning. What else is in there, sir? Are you okay? I'm surgery. Yeah. Over here. I'm Your eyes are, yes. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, surgery is too big. Uh huh. I'm not sure you'd be able to. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't like the mask. Yeah. I hope you feel better. <laughs> and I know that there'll be meetings that I have. Oh. I guess I have to go on I know. Good morning, everybody. It is uh, Wednesday, May 11th, 2022, and I call the Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority Board of Directors into the meeting. Okay, I pledge allegiance, Ms. Uh, Director Chato, would you please lead us? Flag, United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Director Chato. All right. Uh, please call the roll. Dan Leiner. Here. Here. Abby Canola. Present. Beatrice Chato. Here. Here. Aaron Munoz. Here. Hi, Anna. Okay, uh, please let the record show. Uh, Anna, uh, Vice Chair Anna Jimenez is here. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. All right, a safety briefing. Mr. Mer Rendon. Good morning, Board of Directors, Mr. Chair. Our safety briefing. If there's an emergency, all Board of Directors will exit through the rear door by the kitchen. All the public will exit to my immediate right. Directors will report to the clock tower. Marisa will make sure that everybody's accounted for, and I'll make sure that everybody exits this building properly. During the emergency, please do not return back to the building. And if we have to shelter in place, we'll shelter in the west side stairwell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rendon. 
Have you said that we have any conflict of interest affidavit? Thank you, ma'am. Agenda item five, opportunity for public comment. The limit is three minutes and you can't yield your time to another person. Do we have any public comment? We do have three signed up in person. The first one signed up is Beth Owens um, from Port A. Pardon me? Okay. That's fine. Uh, and Chris Collins. Get a minute and a half each. <laughs> Depends who takes up three minutes. <laughs> we can take up three minutes. What was, your saying, what was your name, sir? My name is Chris Collins. Chris Collins, thank you. I'm also from Port Aransas. Okay. Yeah, and, and yep, sorry, I'm Beth just, Owens. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. Ms. Owens yeah, and, just, and Chris, so y'all have the floor. Yeah. Okay, we just signed up to speak. Um, I know there's going to be uh, a vote amongst the board on the 95 Express Port Aransas route. Uh, the last several years, it's been a pilot route for us, and it has helped our community tremendously. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to thank y'all for working with us the last several years on this route. Um, it's really helped a lot of people that don't have, you know, transportation coming from areas that, you know, maybe they're having a hard time finding a job or a job that pays well. You know, it's brought a lot of people into our community and we've been able to provide great jobs for them. And uh, we want to continue to do that. And I thank you for your consideration and making it a permanent route. Uh, like I said, it's been great for our community. And we just wanted to say thank you and uh, yes. offer our support and anything that we can do to help. Yes, and e even our current employees that have worked for us and have cars, they like to hop on the bus instead of waiting on that ferry because, as you know, the bus comes up, they get on the ferry, and they're immediately to work. And uh, we can't thank you enough. I know it's been an unusual two years with COVID and restrictions and, and everything, but we really appreciate y'all. Um, doing the pilot, I and I'm hoping that y'all will make it permanently um, a route for us. Great. Anyone have any questions or we, anything? We can't, we can't take any questions. Or, or, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. That's Hello. Just pure public. Uh, I yes, should know that. But thank y'all for coming all this way. We really appreciate it. You're thank welcome. You. Thank, thank y'all. Next up, we have Angelo Cucuza with TWU of America. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Landecker and members of the board. Once again, my name is Angelo Cucuza, and I'm the National Organizing Director for the TWU of America AFL-CIO. It has been 34 days since we were last here before you. And at that last meeting, 20 workers and supporters submitted or presented testimony in support of the RTA workers' desire for union representation. And in those 34 days, we have not heard a single word back from you about those requests for representation recognition until about 6 p.m. last night. In conveying your silence to their requests, your workers' responses to us were pretty much all the same. Why would they respond? They don't care about us. It's unfortunate that they would feel this way about all of you, but there is no sugarcoating the fact that you really don't listen to them. Just like when they go to HR to voice a concern and find nothing but empty desks in the office during their lunch or breaks. It's pretty discouraging. With all this said, we are here once again to ask that you sit with your workers who wish to organize, create some sort of meet and confer scenario, which includes right to work provisions and agree to some basic worker rights, such as a discipline appeal process that doesn't end with, if you don't like our decision, you can hire an attorney to fight it, a true worker management safety committee, a union bulletin board, a committee to build better schedules and mandatory overtime rules, break room access to workers for dues authorization sign up, and a more effective way of notifying workers of any policy changes. All of this would be in everyone's best interest here at RTA. Simple asks like these that would begin with you recognizing your worker's desire to be re represented by TWU can help pave the way to a better working environment and help build morale and improve worker retention rates here at RTA that are currently somewhat alarming. Before I conclude, I want to touch on something that I brought forward last month, and it is your silence that has caused TWU to take this action. 
In mid-April, TW sent a letter of opposition to the Federal Transit Administration seeking to block your request for federal grant funding approved at the April board meeting. It is unfortunate that we were forced into this decision, but these federal taxpayer grant requests now come with caveats related to labor-friendly mandates currently not existent at RTA. As has been related to all of us by senior leadership of the current federal administration, no work of justice, no money. I continue to hold out hope that we can reach a point where we can retract that which we filed and replace it with a new letter of support for even greater funding. But we are nowhere near that given this, your continued silence to your workers' needs and concerns. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And there is no more public comments. Thank you, Mayor. All right, going on to agenda item number six, uh, discussion and possible action to approve the Board of Directors meeting minutes April 6, 2022. Oh, if I could just say something real quick. I just want to let the public know um, that each employee that in the, under the current guidelines that we have, each employee can be represented by any union that they would like and or an attorney. We have a formal grievance process in place right now uh, that they can follow. I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that in the public and our employees, there is a formal process and you can show up there with any re union representative you'd like. And I just wanted to make sure that was clear to everybody. Thank you. Agenda item six, discussion and possible action to approve the board of directors meeting minutes, April 6, 2022. I have a motion. Approve the meeting. Who is that? Uh, Director Canales, thank you. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, thank you. Uh, please let the record show Director Woolbright is at the meeting. I have a second by Director Woolbright. Any discussion, comments? There are none. All in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Thank you, Anna. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Agenda item six, and Jorge, we need to add uh, the committee chair report for the uh, rule and the small chairs committee to that, please. Agenda, I missed that on the on the review. My apologies, that was my fault. <laughs> Agenda item seven, committee chair reports, uh, administration and finance. Uh, Director Canales. Uh, at this time, I unfortunately will defer uh, that uh, presentation to Chairwoman Ana Jimenez, as I was unable to attend that meeting. Director Jimenez, you have the floor, ma'am. Good morning, everybody. Nothing needs to report on that side. Actually, it was Lynn that ran the meeting. Uh, Thank you, Lynn. So, but, but I was just in attendance, and there's nothing to report. Thank you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> operations and capital projects, uh, Chairman Salazar. Um, I have nothing to report other than there is a trip that's scheduled to look at important staff is going it's important that uh, anybody that's able to attend to try to at least see because we're looking at obviously the funding to get those buses here so important consideration and staff has reached out and I think it's important if we can approach the trip thank you and for the record uh, so the public knows on uh, May 20th May 20th here. Uh, do we have a time yet? What do you Sorry? For the rural and small committees meeting? Mm -hmm. May 20th? Mm -hmm. Has the time been set? Okay. Mike, can you give us details on the 20th? Uh, it's uh, 12 noon. 12 noon? Yes, sir. Uh, so let the public record show on May 20th. We're going to have the uh, rural and small uh, cities uh, committee meeting uh, chaired by Chairwoman uh, Patricia Dominguez. Okay, agenda item uh, eight, uh, presentation by the American Public Transportation Association Certificate of Merit, the CCRTA for the 2022 Bus Security Program Excellence. Yes. Uh, Bracken and Webb, huh? Yeah, Mr. Chair and, and board members, the American Public Transportation Association, the national organization for transit agencies, had their uh, their mobility conference in Columbus, Ohio, uh, last week. Uh, at this uh, this meeting, uh, on one of the safety sessions, 
uh, the APTA board uh, made a, an announcement of five transit uh, agencies winning uh, safety awards from the programs that they have uh, throughout the nation. Uh, safety and security is a, is, as you know, is a board priority. Our safety and security department have done an outstanding job of maintaining a safe and secure environment for our riders, employees, and the community. Uh, CCRTA received a Certificate of Merit Award from APTA <coughs> for Security Excellence. This is Security Excellence nationwide. And that uh, the uh, Safety and Security Department was in collaboration with local law enforcement agencies and the like as part of our program. Through our partnership, canine units have been regularly inspecting our buses and facilities to remove and prevent illegal substances from reaching our facilities. Since the program began, incidents have decreased by up to 80%. Phenomenal. Winners of APTA Safety Security Excellence Awards include five systems, California, Indiana, Ontario, Quebec, and us in Texas. CCRTA was the only recipient from the state of Texas to receive this award. And I'd like to present the award. Uh, we do have some of our partners here with us. We have Chris Ramon from Robstown Police Department. Chris, thank you, sir. And other officers of uh, the department uh, that are here for us. So, Mike, do you have any additional comments on the, the award? Good morning. morning. This is our, our handler. Uh, he's from Robstown uh, Police Department, uh, a canine unit uh, storm. As you, as you saw, he came in like a storm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we, uh, as, as we uh, do our safety security uh, report, you know, I know I keep telling you guys what, what the service that we get with good partnership with uh, Chief Ramon and his uh, officers. It's, it's all about safety and, and making sure that our customers are, are safe, feel safe in our transfer station and our system. We do have also uh, uh, officers that ride our system. So this is a whole combination of a Colossus law enforcement uh, effort from Robstown to Corpus, CCPD, uh, uh, CCISD. It's all a team effort, like Mr. Jeremy says, one team, one dream and is to keep our uh, community, our staff, and our customers safe. Chief, would you wanna come say something? I think, uh, I think I heard Chris, my name is Rex Ramon. <laughs> and uh, first of all, uh, board, thank you for inviting us this morning. And it's like Mr. Rendon said here, uh, we're here to work together. Uh, uh, as a team, and, and I think that uh, I arrived in Robstown about uh, eight months ago, uh, and, and uh, when you say team, that's what we are. Uh, anytime that Mr. Rendon calls upon us, we, we approach matters you know, to take care of issues, uh, if there's some, right? Uh, and I hope it continues like that, Mr. Rendon. Uh, thank you for inviting us this morning, and if we can be of any help, we're there just uh, to the west. <laughs> I guess uh, I don't know how many miles uh, can. I don't know how many miles it is. But uh, thank you for inviting us this morning. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to, to answer any. Questions for the chief? Mike, we would like to come down and, and present the certificate to you and the, and the chief. And we really appreciate this program. It was the only canine program nationally at APTA that was recognized for the great coordination that is going on. So we thank you, Mike. Good job. Thank you, all Board, guys. I'm pleased to present to you a safety excellence award from APTA. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Belgian. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Malinois. Yeah, Malinois. Yeah. 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 Probably gets confused with Jesus. Uh, no, no, Malinois. She's that's definitely. Right. How, how old is she? She's six now. She's going to college in two weeks. Wow. Thank you. Two graduating. They're such great dogs. They're such great dogs, yeah. Very obedient. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Have a great day, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. Thanks for coming. Oh, yeah. And Mr. Chair and board members, yes, uh, last Saturday, and I didn't have a chance to include this in the Friday packet, but last Saturday we participated in the, the, the 2022 Buck Bay Parade and, uh, and participated with all the events and, in fact, did some things here locally to uh, at our station to recognize Buck Bays and all the good things that they do for the community. But we were provided a, a very special accessible viewing zone to uh, approximately 50 ADA people here locally. And the, we announced that the, uh, the spaces were available and those with the disabilities could come and enjoy the parade firsthand. <coughs> uh, and Excuse thanks me. to the safety and security team, all the employees and guests were able to enjoy a safe and secure environment. In fact, when they brought the dogs to our neighborhood here, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, citizens that were participating with us locally uh, ended up uh, recognizing that it was a good thing to have these animals around to provide safety and security. And in, in addition to all the good things that happened, uh, our bus float in the parade was recognized as a first place entry in the 2022 Buck Day celebration. And we received an award. I'd like to thank all of our vendors who helped us with our float preparation. I'd like to recognize MDR Advertising, Iconic Signs for their good work in helping us put these things together. I especially want to recognize our employees who spent their time doing these things so that the community could enjoy the bus system with a visual presentation. I, I really thank my employees for pitching in to help us do this. I also want to dedicate everyone, in addition to the, the staff that participated, the operators, the drivers, the mechanics, all of those who actually helped in this uh, work. I'd like to recognize Mario Vega, the assistant director of Vegas. I'd like to raise a, recognize Isaac Ortiz, who uh, led the LED lighting group and stuff. Uh, Rene Garcia, our parts lead, who worked with Isaac to secure all the items we needed to ensure the float worked well. We want to recognize Marco <coughs> Gonzalez and Paulino Ochada with uh, the body work and all the waxing and all the extra prep work we needed to get done. And uh, Gerardo Ramos, the, uh, the key in controlling the, the music smoke, the sound, all the good things and the, the, the things that make us the number one entry in our category. I'm proud and dedicated of the workforce that participated with us and I'd like to present to the board our first place trophy. I'm sorry. Got a video. It was okay. amazing oh. guys in person. It okay. looked phenomenal. It looks like a heck of a party bus. <laughs> Thank you.
smoke and everything. Yeah, it was really <laughs> awesome. Nice. And the, and the pirates are from the parking department. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Excellent. I really outdid yourself, Rita. Fantastic. And I'd like to present to you, Mr. Chair, the uh, trophy. Kitchen duty that night, <laughs> and he had about a half a cow. Oh my God! <laughs> that he smoked for the entire night. A hundred hot dogs and crew and the staff uh, not only did the work, but they enjoyed it with their families and their friends. And it was a good parade too. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, okay. And again, congratulations, and thank you again for all that hard work. That took a lot of work. <clears throat> Agenda item nine, consent items. Um, just a reminder, uh, you can pull, we only have one agenda item, but this is routine in nature. It's been submitted to the committees, and uh, you can pull it if you'd like to. If not, I'll entertain a motion for agenda item nine, a, action to award multiple contracts for bus parts supply. Yeah, and, and we're going to ask that this item be pulled. We have a couple of outstanding items that we need to work through. We'll ask that this item be tabled. Be tabled, yes. All right, never mind. <laughs> but the, the item on the, the pilot route, 93, 95, you've heard the people from Robson who have benefited from that service and ask that that item move forward. Ask that this item be the agenda? Yep, 11. All right, do I have a motion to table the agenda item 9A, action to award multiple contracts for bus parts, supply, air system, air conditioning, brake system, body, chassis, cooling system, electrical, glass suspension, glass suspension, wheelchair ramp, and transmission parts to reschedule the May Board of Directors meeting for May 4th, May 11th, 2022. I'll move. Motion by Director Salazar. I'll second. second. Second by Director Canales. Any discussion on the table? There are none. All in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Oh, same sign. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Are Porter Ranges folks still in the crowd? Yeah, no, no. We need to move to 10. I, I jumped ahead, so I'm sorry. Item 10 is next. Uh, hold here just a second. Right. Are our Porter Ranges people still in the crowd? They're not. Okay. All right. I was going to move it up on the agenda okay. if they were waiting on us. All right. Agenda item 10, update on the RCAT committee activities. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Sharon Wonthus, Managing Director of Capital Programs and Customer Services. Um, 
basically, I'll be brief. I know we have a long agenda. These are the meeting points and the recap. We had a presentation from Texas Workforce Solutions, Vocational Rehabilitation Services. It was an outstanding presentation. I updated the committee on the Board of Directors' uh, new committee structures. I did confirm that the RCAP members were reappointed. I informed them that Philip Ramirez provided an update on the Del Mar College bus stops and that the board voted to support a resolution for the Lono emission grant and the grant for buses and bus facilities. Provided the beeline service performance, the um, standards are being met regarding denials and miles between row call, and they are closer to meeting the standard for the passengers for, per hour. Things are still uh, more or less rectifying themselves since COVID. And we had about 2,765 wheelchair boardings. Our next meeting is Thursday, May 19th, 2022, at noon in this room. Thank you, sir. That Thank concludes. you, Ms. Montes. Thank yes, you very sir. much. Uh, agenda item 11, we have a presentation and public hearing for public feedback, Title VI, Service Equity Analysis Findings and Service Recommendations for Pilot Routes 93 and 95. The reason why we're doing it right there. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. The priority for this is public image and transparency. And for some background, the Federal Transit Administration defines a pilot service as a temporary demonstration project. And if a temporary service addition or change lasts longer than 12 months, the FTA considers the service to be permanent and the grantee must conduct a Title VI service equity analysis. The public hearing is required due to major service changes and that's per the FTA circular and by our public input policy. So, so for some background, the pilot Route 93 Flex began in August of 2019. It replaced the Route 63 Wave, and it serves the Texas A&M University Corpus Christi and branches out to the Flower Bluff area for the Walmart and HEB. The Pilot Route 95 Port Aransas Express began in May of 2019, and it serves Port Aransas, Ingleside, and the Aransas Pass areas and connects them with Corpus Christi. And it, it, it offers priority boarding on the ferry vessels and we've made some fine tuning adjustments to the routing and schedules to help make uh, sure we're meeting the rider needs. This is a, a map of the pilot route 93. And here you can see on the left side that the main portion of its route, which is in between the, the campus and the, the apartments all along Enos Jocelyn. And also the dotted line going out to HEB, which is the, the flex portion, which you can request rides out to the HEB or the Walmart. And there's also a clinic and some other restaurants in that area. This shows an example of the service that we've been running at by hours. So it's approximately every 30 minutes along Enos Jocelyn. And for the performance, it does meet the service standard requirements, which for a flex route was five to 10 passengers per hour. And this is our ridership uh, basically prior to COVID and then afterwards. You can see that it did decrease to 6.2 passengers per hour in 2021, but so that was an increase from 2020, and we're expecting to continue to see an increase as the university goes into more on-campus learning. Here's a map of the 95 Port Aransas Express, and so this is a large area where we're showing a very broad view, and that we're, we were uh, beginning at the Southside Station during certain times, and then going to Staple Street Station before we headed out to do our rounds between the Ingleside Aransas Pass and Port Aransas. Here's an example of the map within Port Aransas. So you can see that we have several stops along Alistair and 11th Street, basically through all the, the dining areas and also where the IGA and the other service areas people would want to go to. This is an example of the schedule that we had run. The, the seasonal service is generally from late May through early October. We usually begin at the Friday before Memorial Day and end it at the very end of September or the beginning of October, depending on how the schedule falls. In 2020, we did make an attempt to run from March 2nd, which is prior to spring break through October 4th, but prior to us, I mean, we made that decision prior to COVID becoming a, an issue. And the service does operate seven days a week. Here, the, the passengers per hour levels did meet the service standards when you compare it with the pre-COVID-19 period, which for a commuter or express is two to five passengers per hour. In 2019, our first year, you see we were at 2.5 passengers per hour 
Patches per revenue hour. 2020, we had an obvious drop off from COVID. And then 2021, it was at 1.5, though we had some struggles getting the, the workers in there because of restrictions based off of COVID until probably the July ish timeframe. Here you can see a chart of the ridership. So, blues, 2019 were the, the peaks. And the one thing I've pointed out is in 2021, while we had a slow start because of that difficulty getting the workers in, you can see that it uh, actually started to increase. And by September, we had actually surpassed what we were doing in 2019. And this is a comparison between the, the 93, 95 and all of the other small fixed routes that use the cutaway style vehicles. So you can see that prior to, to COVID, the 93 Flex is one of our highest performing routes for the, the cutaways at 12.1 passengers per hour. The Route 16, which services Del Mar and Bear Lane and that the VA clinic or the, it was the only one that exceeded that. And then when you look at 2021, which is after COVID, it is still among the highest of the routes. And then when you look at the, the 95 and that it had a, this is just for a weekday schedule. So that's why the numbers are different from earlier, but 2.8 passengers per hour. And you can see that puts it above the, the 54, which serves Gregory, just below the 65, which services the island and goes out to Port Aransas. And it's on par with the Route 3, which services the Naval Air Station. And then when you look at uh, post-COVID, you know, current, it's at 1.5, which still exceeds the other services there in Port Aransas, including it, it exceeds the, the 65. And it's still, you know, comparable to the, the Route 3 while it's still slightly below. This is just an example of the things that we look at through the service equity analysis. Here, we're, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, how it affects minority groups. So the darker the shading, the, the, the more participation we're bringing in. And with that Route 95, this is just another example. This is looking at economic diversity. So you can see that we're including some other areas. In the end, for the pilot Route 93, no disparate impacts or disproportionate burdens were aden identified with the permanent addition of this service as multiple underlying services, including the Routes 3, 4, 5, 29, 37, and 60 are available with the pilot Route 93 service area, and we have connections to those services. With the pilot Route 95, no disparate impacts or disproportionate burdens were identified with the permanent addition of this service as it removes existing service gaps in the San Patricio County area. And for a summary, more service options are available to the public, which results in no disparate impacts or disproportionate burdens on the basis of race, color, or national origin. These are, for the public hearing notice was posted March 1st, and these are some examples of where we were posting it on social media and on the, the websites and newspapers. These are some of the public outreach events that we did, which were at our transfer stations. We were in Port Aransas and we were on the campus of Texas A&M. In all, we had 138 surveys that were collected as of May 3rd, 2022. And this is showing a breakdown of how often the, these people used public transportation. Then when we asked if they had utilized the Route 93 or 95, this shows a breakdown of who used either one, both, or hadn't used any of them. And when we asked if you would like to see the Route 93 Flex become a permanent route, we had 100% of the respondents say yes. And then with the Route 95 Express, it was the same question. We had 87.5% say they wanted it to become a permanent route. And then when asked, do you feel that accessible, flexible transportation for students and community members to Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi, and essential nearby destinations is important to the area, 100% said yes. And then when asked, do you feel that affordable direct transportation for essential workers, tourists, and guests to and from Port Aransas is important to the area? We had 100% say yes. And with that, staff requested the Board of Directors approve making the pilot routes 93 and 95 permanent. And I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Derek. Any questions for Derek? I just have a comment, Mr. Chair. I think it's great that we had real buy-in today from Chris and Beth, and it really says a lot about their direction for that community. So I think it's great that we have that support and approve the first motion. I'm losing my thought here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a chance in a second. <laughs> real quick. Yes, sir. Um, I apologize. I'll take a very quick call. 
the ridership numbers compared to an average route? All right, let me go back over here. There's so many slides. All right, so this is a comparison of when you look at the other small fixed routes or services that use the cutaway style buses. And I do that because they have a smaller capacity, so we want to compare apples to apples. So with the, the pilot route 93 before COVID, it was one of the highest performing with the route 16, which services Bear Lane, Del Mar, and the VA being the only one that exceeded that. And even still, it's still among that, the highest, and we're expecting- 93 is Port Aransas, correct? 93 is Texas A&M, 95 is Port Aransas. Okay. So with the, the 93, we expect to see that to continue to grow up as the, go up as the university moves more in the, um, having people on, on campus. So the 95, you can see it was at 2.8, which is above what we do our service to Gregory prior to COVID. It was comparable to our other service to Port Aransas, which stops on that, goes the other way to the islands, provides service. And it, it, it was uh, performed better than the FlexiBeat in 94, which are in Port Aransas. And it was even with the, the Route 3, which services the Naval Air Station in the Flower Bluff area. If you look at uh, after COVID, it's at 1.5, which still exceeds what we're doing in Gregory and the other services in Port Aransas, including the 65. And it, it's close to what we're doing with the Naval Air Station, and that was a little bit below that. Now, the, the struggle last year with that 2021 data, again, was that they really couldn't get the workers in until about July, so we were already halfway through our service before we were actually able to start getting ridership on there. And that was due to restrictions on the, the work visas and things like that, so. Got it. Okay. That's all needed. Thanks. Thank you, Director Warbuck. Anybody else would like to have a question or comment? The only, uh, I do want to add a comment. I do yes. think that these types of services are exactly where we can provide a tremendous amount of value to uh, non-standard, non-typical riders by being an economic engine for new areas, which was personally the reason I got on this board to begin with. So I think it's a great idea. Uh, add one other comment. Even though I'm talking about the, the workers there the, with the, the visas, we did have several riders at, towards the middle of the summer with, with the University of Texas Marine Life Center that started riding the route and they were actually disappointed when it ended. <laughs> and they wanted to become a full year round service so they didn't have to drive their car all the way to Port Aransas. Right. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you, Derek. Agenda item 12, discussion on possible action to approve making pilot routes 93 and 95 permanent. So uh, moved. I got a motion by director, wait, hang on. I think uh, Secretary Allison claimed that earlier. <laughs> I got it, I, I, Secretary Allison made the motion, Director Wilbright seconded. Yep. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all, hearing none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay, agenda item uh, 13, discussion and possible action to adopt the revised 2022 emergency preparedness policy. Mr. Rendon. Good morning again. Glad you're not wearing that lanyard today. <laughs> I've been in my back pocket. But I'll, I'll respect you, sir, this morning. Uh, so CCRTA uh, board priority is safety security. Uh, a little background on the uh, policy. Uh, during, during and after a, a emergency situation, the CCRTA has the responsibility to provide a service to the citizens of Corpus Christi and all of our small city service areas, uh, including Nueces County unincorporated area like Petrolina. CCRTA has a, a responsibility to work with the City of Corpus Christi and Oasis County Emergency Management Office, uh, EMO. Um, way back then when I started working for the RTA, I didn't know the difference between EMO and the EOC. <laughs> so the EMO is the Emergency Management Office. That's, they stay there, it's a, a permanent office. One is, once it's activated that there's an emergency, it becomes the emergency operation center, still in the same location. So um, to provide emergency preparedness and evacuation service in the community within the RTA service area relating to hurricanes and other emergency uh, requirement evacuation, and this has to do sometimes like refineries have a, 
a big fire that happened about a couple of years ago. Uh, good thing that the wind was blowing uh, south and we were prepared to evacuate the, uh, uh, that part of the uh, community on the, on the north side. We didn't have to, but we were called upon. Also, uh, when there's a sustained winds, uh, when they get up to 35 miles per hour or more, or if there's any flooding, RTA will suspend uh, services immediately for safety reasons. Is that citywide? Yes. How about flooding? Is it just the localized? No. In the areas where there's flooding, you know, because our, our uh, buses are, are low, there's not a, a lot of areas that we can go because there's um, once it's considered there's flooding, th the whole system is uh, is stopped. Okay, thank you, sir. So the application, the policy applies to all CCRTA employees, including part-time and temporary employees. <coughs> emergency event is an emergency that refers to natural or man-made uh, event, uh, such as hurricane, tornado, storm, flooding, or any disaster weather uh, condition non-weather related emergencies. The um, uh, essential positions are the employees who are required to be available uh, to work. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. The essential uh, employee is uh, a person who volunteers to be part of, of the team. Uh, he's considered also a, a, a essential position once he says he wants to volunteer and uh, during the emergency. Non-essential em employees are securing the RTA property uh, after that and department heads can release them to go home. Uh, the employee ref refuge of last resort, there's two locations here at the Staple Street Center and the uh, Bear Lane Operation Facility. Essential employees are, of course, our CEO, managing directors, all directors, uh, bus operators and, and mechanics. The uh, non-essential are receptionists, clerks, uh, custodians, and, and people that, like in, in accounting. So the initial phase, um, our CEO at the end of this month will de declare the uh, emergency response plan is activated, which starts June the 1st, and that's when hurricane season starts. Department uh, directors notify employees and public employees' responsibility in emergency and reporting expectations. So this three is basically the core of the policy. Phase three is all employees must report to work. Uh, we will secure CCRTA property. Non-essential employees obtain approval uh, to evacuate. And employees must provide their phone numbers and locations where they can be reached. Phase two is uh, the EOC liaison will advise department heads on the location of the em employee's refuge of last resort. We have Gordon that's here. He does the city and West does the county EOC. All essential employees will report to work and non-essential employees may be released at that time. So phase one is actually if the storm is hitting, so hazardous conditions are imminent, the EOC staff will update the RTA on the, uh, the location of the storm. And uh, we will move or do some type of service if we have to. Uh, five years ago, almost five years ago with Harvey, uh, they, the Sheriff Department requested us to move the prisoners from the annex to the main county jail. Um, the firefighters uh, asked to be uh, transported to the dome by Del Mar. Uh, Westside campus and then <laughs> while working at the EOC uh, our power went went down and the big generator went down and we called our good friends at RTA to transport us to the airport so those things happen and if we can provide that service we will and then the return to duty policy is that um, when the storm is over all in all employees must report back to work, and if they can't, they must call in and speak to a supervisor and let them know the reason they can't. That's basically the policy. So staff request the board of directors approve and revise the uh, 2022 emergency preparedness policy. 
Thank you, Mr. Unknown. Any questions for Mr. Unknown? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Unknown. Okay, we're on agenda item 13. Discussion, possible action. Do I have a motion? So move. I'll entertain a motion, please. So move. Director Chadro, I made uh, the motion. Second. On the Second committee. by direct, uh, Vice Chair Jimenez. Further discussion? Turn down all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, Marisa, I saw a, a Judge Gonzalez, Director Gonzalez, on remotely, but I don't know if he's still on remotely or not. Yes, he's there. Is he there? Okay. Could you note in the record that he attended remotely? Uh, agenda item 14, discuss on possible action to award a contract to AdTech te Technologies for server and storage replacement. Mr. Saldana. All right. Good morning. Good morning, sir. This aligns with the board priority of innovation. So a little background. Um, our servers have been in place since 2016. And the typical life for these assets are three to five years. So obviously we're pushing year number six on this. Uh, obviously our server ser servers uh, create uh, Vital function for us here. They help operate our applications. They house all our user information as well as our telephone system. What we're looking for today is three uh, purchase three Dell servers, one Dell storage uh, appliance, two Dell 10 uh, gigabyte fiber switches, on site installation as well as configuration of the servers, and a five year warranty. Abtech uh, Technologies. Um, offers scalable solutions, so this is gonna help us uh, with our technology for today and in the future. Um, they'll meet our computer security needs with today's environment. Uh, they've been in service for about 30 years and they focus in on designing, configuring, and creating platforms for IT uh, customers. And they are our current provider right now. What we're gonna do here is scale this down um, from the three servers to one server in here to a single glass pane uh, this will help accelerate our performance and become more energy efficient for us. Financial impact, we're looking to purchase this through the Texas Department of Information Resources, the DIR, which basically pulls uh, local government accounts together to help leverage our buying power in here, provide better products and services at a better price. Our estimated budget is $113,631.14, and this is in our 22 CIP on their local funds. So at this point, uh, staff requests the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer or designee to award a contract to Abtech Technologies uh, for server and storage replacement. And I will take whatever questions you may have. Any questions for Mr. Salania? Mr. Dominguez, it looks like you're ready. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to approve. All right, I have a motion by Director Dominguez. Do I have a second? Second, Ana Jimenez. Third, uh, second by Vice Chair Jimenez. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, let's see, agenda item 15, discussion of possible action to award a contract to computer solutions for Cisco network switches for replacement number one. Oh, phase one, excuse me. All right, uh, so this award, uh, aligns with board priority of innovation as well. Now these two work hand in hand together, the servers and the switches. The switches help the servers talk to all the computers in here. So this switches have been in place since 2017, so we're in year five of that, and obviously that's pushing the life warranty as well. Just like the servers, they provide a critical function um, of keeping the computers and telephone <coughs> system operational. Uh, we are talking phase one here is for Bear Lane for our servers, our switches out there to look to replace. At this time, we're replacing, looking to replace seven Cisco 10 gigabyte fiber switches, including the warranty, uh, network modules, and power supplies, as well as remote configuration. This phase one, like I just said, uh, covers bare lane for the switches out there. The 10 gig uh, infrastructure in here, so it provides end-to-end -end security um, for potential hacks. Computer Solutions is a leading provider for the Southwest, uh, South Texas area and they're based out of San Antonio. And they're our current provider for our 
network switches as well. So these switches will help provide scalable solutions for us uh, to meet today's needs and tomorrow's. It has a, a new UPOE Plus technology, which basically gives more power to the switches for our new cameras that, that demand a little more power than our existing cameras in here. And they provide a smart, simple, highly secure, uh, designated through a Wi-Fi 6. So it's a, it'll help us today and beyond. The financial impact, again, this will be through a DRI. Estimated budget is $67,258.70, and this is in our 2022 CIP as local funds as well. So at this time, staff requests the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer or designee to award a contract to Computer Solutions for Cisco Network Switches Replacement Phase 1. Any questions for Mr. Solana? I do. On the, uh, the Phase 1, how mm -hmm. long uh, from implementation, uh, from start to implementation? Or, or it's going to be a few months, depending on when we can get everything in. Um, with supply chains that we're having right now, we'll place the order as soon as we say yes. And if they have it in stock, we're probably mm -hmm. talking about three months in here. If not, it could be towards the end of the year if um, you have supply chain issues and they come in. So this is phase one. What's phase two? Phase two will be the network switches here at... Uh, and that will be in 2023? Sensor. Yes, ma'am. It will okay. be in 2023. And that'll be around the same... About the, same, about the same cost. This one will here is 67. Depending on what inflation does and everything else, we're expecting about 68 to 70 thousand dollars, depending on inflation there. On 30 percent. Well, yes. Any for, any other uh, questions or comments from the board? There are none. I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve phase one. Second. Second. Director Dominguez. I didn't hear the second. Second. Allison. Allison, uh, Secretary Allison made the second. Any further discussion? There are none. All in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saldana. Uh, agenda item 16, adelante. <laughs> Update on the public <laughs> feedback, marketing design, and long-range long system plan. Good morning, Good everyone. Morning. I'm here today to give you an update on our long-range system plan design survey and as you recall the names are plate forward and vamanos in the spanish versions adelante <coughs> and vamanos we marketed uh we went out and did a general public survey with our um to the public we wanted to do it in person to make sure that they could understand what we were asking them so we did that in person and then we did a online employee survey as well and the results fleet forward 94 vomino 66 so today staff requests that the board of directors approve the fleet forward and adelante brand for the ccrta long ran long range system plan any questions for rita how soon will this uh, kick off? In term, how long will we see? Uh, uh, they will start on the 17th, promoting uh, the uh, outreach people or the uh, night guard people will be here on the 17th and they will begin the surveys. And we will start placing all of our uh, um, wraps, bus benches, and all of that <coughs> in, in the coming weeks. 17th of May. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's 17th. I think that Iconic Signs said they could get them up, <coughs> the wraps probably on the 20th to 23rd. So we're in the queue. We were just waiting for the approval. And that includes uh, social media promotion? And yes, we'll start the social media as quickly as possible. The physical, all the other physical equipment we'll have to do. And we're going to do a press release and get a media blitz going. So we'll, we'll promote it heavily to make sure that the community understands what it is. I entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. Me. I had a, I had a motion by Vice Chair Jimenez. Second. I have a second by Director Canales. Any further discussion? All in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Rita. You. Thanks Thank for you all your hard much. work on this. I know you are arm wrestling a lot. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, agenda item 17, presentations, uh, 17A, defined benefit plan, actuarial 
valuation report. Good morning, Robert Salvati, Managing Director of Administration. Remotely, we have um, Laura Stewart and Joseph Myers. Uh, they're going to talk about our defined benefit plan as well as our post-employment benefits um, plan as well. Laura, you have the floor. Thank you very much. You want me to go ahead and advance? Yes. Okay. Ready to present our slide. Uh, I will present the defined benefit results, and Joe will present the Next slide, please. Okay. Just an overview of the defined benefit plan. This is a benefit that's eligible to all employees. The benefit is earned during employment in of service times earnings, and so that's how you get the benefit. That's payable in retirement through the age 62. And while they're working, they have to be employed at least three years in order to be eligible for their benefit. And then after three years, there's a graded schedule of 10% per year so that they're fully vested after seven years. And then once they retire, they can choose from various optional forms of this monthly benefit. When we're valuing the liabilities of the plan, we look at the participant data, um, the active employees and retirees, and then we also look at the assumptions that we make um, for future events. You know, when will people retire, how much money will they make while they're working, um, all of that goes into our valuation. So first we see the participant counts here. Uh, you can see that we're filing for 2021 and 2022. Um, the different participant categories include active, who are actively employed, um, RTA employees, uh, deferred vested, which means they've terminated employment, but they have not yet begun receiving the benefits. And finally, retired and beneficiaries. So these are the, the participants who are actually receiving that monthly benefit. So if you look at the 2022 column, you see the active count is 217 employees. That terminated group is 189 and retired is 210, so a total of 660. Overall, um, we did see some retirements um, during the year, but then, of course, new hires would come in and replace those retirements. Next slide, please. Here we show an overview of the actuarial valuation results. Um, I mentioned that we use data and assumptions to estimate the liability, and then we compare that to the asset value of the plan. Here you can see the last four years, uh, the actuarial value of assets is in orange. So this would be the smooth average value of the assets. And for 2022, that value was 47.3 million. But the, the liability of the plan that's been earned currently, the current benefit, is around 50 million. So that means there's a shortfall of about 2.8 million um, currently on their state talk about that shortfall more in a moment. Um, there's also a very small um, small blue bar here that's the current normal cost. That normal cost is the present value of the benefits that are earned during the year. So you can think of the, the top of the dark blue as being the current liability, and then the light blue is what would be added to it during the year. And then the green is just what we project to be earned in the future. You can see over time the, the asset value, that orange bar, is going up. Um, the unfunded, that blue section, is going down as, that, as the plan is becoming better funded. And at the bottom, you can see the funding percentage is 94% this year. So again, good asset returns, contributions being made to the plan have led to a good funded status of 94% for 2022. Here you see the numerical values from the graph previously. I won't uh, say those again. I'm just pointing out the actuarially determined contribution. That means we take uh, the value of the benefits earned during the year and look at the unfunded liability, and that's 1.3 million is our uh, determined contribution. Next slide, please. Here's the 
history of accommodations that have been made to the plan. And you can see that these are fairly steady over the years, and that's intentional. We use these assets and the Little Option liability to make sure that the contribution are smooth over time. Next slide, please. So here's the actual component of that contribution amount. Again, showing values for 2021 and 2022. That normal cost value, again, is the benefits earned during the year, $988,000. And then there's an amortization piece where you take that unfunded accrued liability, that $3 million, and you amortize that over time. And each year, that time period goes down by one year. So currently, it gets 12 years. So if we take that unfunded liability, amortize that over 12 years, that's $342,000. So that total contribution of $1,330,000. Do you have any questions for me on the defined benefit plan? Any questions? No, ma'am. Please proceed. Yes, thank you. I'll turn it over to Joe to talk about the OPEC West Valley issues. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Just a bit on the slide thing. So the OPEC plan is really we're talking about the retiree medical, dental, and vision benefits. Notice the Mr. Bell's following point is the ones who meet the eligibility requirements either have to be age 62 or a retiree with age 65 with 10 years of service. The key aspect on this plan that's different from the pension plan is that benefits are only provided to retirees and spouses until age 65, which you'll see on a further slide that this liability is much lower than the pension plan. As I mentioned, the benefits include medical, dental, and vision coverages. And in order to get the coverage, retirees and spouses are required to pay monthly contributions to receive benefits. Due to the cost of the plan, we assume that only 25% of the retirees actually elect this plan. Currently, it only has seven retirees receiving benefits. So it's a very evil business trying to win 5% of the class. And one other key aspect is the plan is not funded. So the plan is paid for on a pay-as-you-go basis. The accrued benefit obligation over time most recently has been hovering just above the $800,000 level. So compared to a $50 million pension plan, you can see that this plan is much less expensive. And this is mainly due to the fact that benefits are only payable until age 65. Next slide, please. The most current valuation we gave was this year, which was actually results for the end of the year. The liability is just over $834,000. It is not pre-funded. Active benefits are accruing as people gain service and become older at the rate of about $45,000 a year. And the plan is expected to pay about $150,000 in benefits over the next year. And that concludes our presentation on both plans. Does anyone have any questions on either plan? One question from Director Wilbright. On the second plan, can you walk through just the differences between the two? It seems like seven people using it and only one in four wanting to use it. It doesn't seem like the most responsible use of our efforts. Well, sure. Well, the plan, as I mentioned, the plan, first of all, only covers until age 65 because that's when Medicare is available. So the retirees do have a way to get medical coverage at age 65. So it's really, the plan is really meant to be sort of a safety net to provide medical coverage for retirees prior to Medicare being available. The second part of your question was the 25% participation. The plan does charge employees a premium for coverage. So that gives the retiree an opportunity to either see if their spouse has coverage and they can add to their spouse's plan, or they can get coverage in the marketplace. Or thirdly, if they're close to 
point to the A65, perhaps, or go off, go without progress for a short period of time, put it in $100,000. And is that premium? You're right, it's it. Sorry, the premiums they're paying, is that going into paying out the payments, or where do those premiums go? Yeah, yeah, it, it's used to offset the, uh, the payments. Okay. Whatever you may look at. So Thanks. The way the shown on, on this slide is really net of what the retirees pay. Any more questions? Further questions? <clears throat> no, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item 17C, March 2022 financial report. All right. All right. Good morning. You again. haven't left yet, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing comfortable shoes today, so we're good. So, our, this is our 2022 March financial report. This aligns with board priority of public image and transparency. Some of the highlights for the month. A bus advertisement is about 108% uh, percent of baseline. Investment income is about 286%. That's just with a uh, rising in interest rates. We're obviously taking advantage of that there. And we're starting to ladder out some of our investments until the end of the year. We're expecting another interest rate hike, so we don't want to ladder out too, too far right now. Departmental expenses are about 97% of baseline as well. So just for our income statement here, total revenues <coughs> are projected to come in at um, $3.9 almost $4 million. And I say projected because later this week we will get our sales tax, which is about 3.1 and change, uh, and that's the majority of that operating revenue of $3,894,000. Our total expenses come in at $3.7 million, so about $270,000 positive cash flow for this month. So here's our revenues. Uh, we want most of your revenues, obviously, to be 100% or better on the far right-hand column. Uh, passenger service is still lagging behind, about 82%. At eighty-five thousand dollars, sales tax again is a projected number that we'll get later on this week at three point one million dollars. Uh, we finally received our preventive maintenance for this year, so we're starting to close some of that revenue gap in there. At six hundred twenty-three thousand dollars, we pulled down this month for preventive maintenance. Um, so we have a total of three hundred three million nine hundred eighty-eight thousand seventy-five dollars. So where'd the money go on the expense side? Purchase transportation, 711000 almost 712000 at 22%. Uh, miscellaneous at $66,854 at 2%. Our other COVID supplies, uh, $22,654 at 1%. And the other supplies are basically to keep the buses on the street at 237000 almost $238,000 at 7%. Salaries and wages, $1 almost $1.2 million at 37%. Benefits a little shy of half a million dollars at 16%. Services, $395,727 at 12%. Utilities, a little shy of 64,000 at 2%. And insurance, a little over 44,000 at 1%. So our expenses, uh, conversely, we want this right-hand column to be below 100%. Salaries and wages, at, uh, almost $1.2 million at 101%. Benefits corresponding with that, a little, over, a little under 500000 at 1.1%. And uh, miscellaneous supplies, uh, materials are at uh, 107% at uh, $260,000. The rest are below. We come out to $3.2 million on a budget of 3.3, so about $100,000 savings on expenses for the month. Our year-to-date number, bus advertisement, about 115%. Investment income about 164%, and then operating expenses are a little under 90% uh, of baseline. Total revenues $9.7 million on a budget of $11 million. Uh, most of that is waiting for American Rescue Plan money to come through. Since they approved our uh, preventive maintenance money, a 5307 portion of it here, we're still waiting for the ARP money to be approved from the federal government. And that's that $5.6 million that we were balancing our budget. Once that comes through, hopefully in the next month or so. Uh, we will backtrack some of those monies to the beginning of the year, and we'll, we'll balance out our, our financial plan here. Expenses come in at uh, $10.3 million on a budget of 11.5, so we have uh, $557,000 in negative cash flow for the year to date. And we expect that usually for the first quarter. And again, that's first quarter is, is low as far as um, sales tax coming in here, as well as waiting for the rescue, American Rescue Plan money. 
So our revenue by category in here, um, our total revenues of nine million seven hundred seventy thousand on a budget of eleven million dollars. Again, the bulk of that comes from sales tax at eight point five million dollars and federal grant assistance at uh, six hundred twenty three thousand dollars. Year to date, where does the money go? Purchase transportation, a little over two million at twenty two percent. Miscellaneous, at one percent at one hundred thirty one thousand dollars. Other a little under seven hundred thousand dollars at eight percent. Salaries and wages, thirty eight percent at almost three point four million dollars. Benefits, a little shy of one point five million dollars at sixteen percent. Services, a little over a million dollars at eleven percent. Utilities, a little over one hundred fifty six thousand at two percent. And insurance a little over $132,000 at 2%. Expenses, uh, year to date, we're at $8,968,079 on a budget of $9.9 .9 million. So about a million dollar savings on expenses year to date per budget. Our fair recovery ratio, um, we're just at 2.45% uh, and kind of just a little history of over the last few years where we've been. Back to that, Robert. Yes, I know sir. you were excluding. Go back one more. Oh, mm -hmm. You're excluding depreciation, street improvements, sub or associated grant agreements. Yes, sir. I go forward. Is that uh, recovery ratio uh, include those other two and but but not depreciation? Yeah, uh, the fair recovery ratio is not any depreciation on there. No, sir. Okay, but mm -hmm. the other two are uh, street improvement plan. No, because we're talking only operational expenses. Those aren't operational expenses on there. How about debt? Uh, that is non-operational as well, too. That's another expense. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just our history of 13-month average of our sales tax, as you see. And then uh, February sales tax, that's the only sales tax we have in the books. Again, we'll get our March a little later this month. In February of 2021, we received uh, $2.33 million. This year, we received two point seven, about a $392,000 increase month over month from last year. Uh, we budgeted 2.99, almost $3 million, received 2.7, so it's about $273,000 less than what we budgeted. Robert, regarding that, you know, I think everybody realizes we're getting ready to hit an inflationary period and possibly recession, sure. meaning less sales tax. Is yes, there a plan in place? Are you starting to create a plan? We are. I kind of, I call it a contingency plan. So I we that's are. That's what the word I was looking for. Yes, sir. So um, we are in the very beginning stages of starting our 2023 budget. Yes, sir. Uh, we're asking everybody right now for their numbers so we can kind of see what we are, are going to get. We're looking at our trends for sales tax, understanding that there could possibly be a recession if we don't have a soft landing at some point in time here, uh, depending on how Fed handles that and supply chain issues and everything else. Um, from there, uh, we do have a, a little backup of about $4 million or so, $4.5 million of American Rescue Plan monies left over from the 17.6. We're having about $7.5 million of American Rescue Plan that we are using to fund our shelter program. We're using $5.6 more million dollars to balance this year's budget. So we leave about 4 to $5 million left over, and some of that will help balance next year's budget because with the recession and having a deficit this year, we're going to need something to balance our budget next this coming year here. And hopefully over the next few years, we're bringing that gap of expenses and revenues down a little bit. So at some point in time, when American Rescue Plan ends, the money, we're, they we're closing that gap up a little bit. Robert, so why don't you also mention the restriction on reserves you have for your operation? Yeah, so we try to balance our budget just through normal operations and, and keeping a balanced budget. We also keep a three-month reserve for operating revenues in case sales tax goes down or something like that happens in there. So we have three months in, in, in as a reserve. Our gotcha. Chapter 451 says we only need two months reserve, but we're more conservative here and we keep three months just in case. We also have a reserve policy for our CIP, so we put some monies aside for that, and then we have a reserve policy uh, for our health care reserve as well, too. So, so we have that. reserve called our unreserved fund, or do you have a different fund? So we have a we – have, we talk – on our financial statements, uh, we'll, we talk about our reserves, total unrestricted reserves, but that includes our our own restrictions. And then we have unrestricted reserves, which is going to be about $25 million. And it'll fluctuate depending on how we pay bills and at the end of the Basically month. Basically, our around savings there. account in terms. Yeah, that, that's not obligated to anything, any any self-imposed reserves, right. including our pension that we put in, that we <coughs> reserve as well. Yes, sir. That $1.3 million that we're looking at. Great. Putting in so year. going into this thing, 
the next year or 18 months or however long it takes us to dip down and come back out, we're, we're in pretty good financial shape. Yes, today to, we're in to good financial this, shape. To weather the storm. Yeah. And, of course, in my position, I'm looking three to five years out all the time as well. So um, we, we, have to, we have some work to do on the three to five year plan. Right now, we're in good shape. I'm, I'm just looking at the next two years. Yes, sir. I conservatively say three to five. I look a little beyond that. But three to five years is a short plan for me. Thank you. Or for us. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you said you had uh, 4.5 million of the American Rescue uh, money that you're that yes, that's that you're going to reserve for 2023 or so that's that's money from the American Rescue Plan that that's not tied to anything. We can use it to balance our budget a little bit for operating expenses, or we can use it for additional capital expenses. And that money has no deadline, or do you have a deadline? Um, to, there is to be spend a, that. There is a deadline, but. We, by using it in 2023 or even 2024, we'll still be okay. All right. Great. Yes, ma'am. The Director uh, Ulbricht. With some of the changes we've seen from the federal government on COVID policies and mandates, uh, do we expect that piece of the budget to start shrinking in months to come? Or we, should we just pinch line 20000 a month going forward? For 20000 a month for? 20 COVID-19 supplies. Oh, yeah. So with COVID supplies, um, we're not – over the last, I guess, four months or so, we haven't spent that much money on COVID supplies as it would been dwindles down a little bit. So we, you will see that dwindle even more. We're not even going to use hardly anything for COVID supplies. We still have the most supplies that we've been using are masks. Um, we still have about, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, about 170, 160,000 masks still in the inventory. Um, I think that'll get us hopefully through it. I don't, I'm not a doctor, but COVID's probably not going away ever again because we can't get rid of the flu. We're not going to get rid of COVID, but it's going to be manageable. So I don't know. If, the mask mandate will come back in full force like it has been. Um, there's, there's still China things happening and whatever else, so it's hard but to But it's predict. not going to be 20000 a month forever? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. That's all I care about. Thanks. Any other questions for Mr. Saldana? All right. Thank you, sir. Procurement update. All right. So our procurement update, this is our uh, May procurement update. This aligns with board priority of public image and transparency. Our current procurements, we have fuel and lubricant uh, Supplies, we, it's a one-year contract with two one-year options, about $114,000 a year. We have our Texas uh, low sulfur diesel, a three-year firm fixed price, about $1.1 million for the three-year period. And then our windstorm and hail insurance, it's a one-year contract at about $132,000 a year. We also have a bus manufacturer, Lono. Um, that's to be determined. Hey, Robert, could you go back? Just I'm just curious. Yes, sir. On the uh, uh, diesel fuel. <laughs> yeah, so that that is. Um, a is there a, is there some clause <coughs> that gets them out of this spike? Or? Well, that is tied to a, a, an index, so um, that's just a projected number. Um, we're hoping by the time it skyrockets, that it is right now, eventually it starts coming back down, and on average, that's what we're going to have for the next three years. But um, when we talk budget, the two some big big concerns I always have are what sales tax comes in that. And fuel; those are two hard things to project. So, so we might we might be running, uh, for lack of a better word, the 1.124 million is a per year cost, right? It's is a three year average. Okay, but when year I give average. you a three year contract and the total, it's going to. I guess what I'm saying is, if we have to spend more money on fuel in a certain calendar or fiscal year, yes, sir. We have the money, or that contract works in some way that we can bring money from the future contract back, or yes, sir, back to it. And, and if it stays high for the three-year period, somewhere <coughs> in the year two, Excuse we'd probably me. come back to the board and ask to, to increase that contract. <coughs> to add to the contract. Yes, sir. Thank you. So the bus manufacturer, the Lono, right now, that really there's no dollar value in there right now because we're waiting to see once we submit it and we get monies in here. Then we'll come back to the board most likely with a budget amendment, and then we'll put a dollar figure in there depending on how much we get from the federal government. We are expecting to have the first of the four – um, RFPs coming back for the repurposing of the Clayburg Bank. It's a two-year period. They're six-month RFPs. Uh, the first one should be coming back sometime this month. Uh, if there is a proposal in there, we'll come back to the board with a proposal and we'll discuss it at that point in time. If not, we'll continue to issue out the RFP for up to three more times beyond this one. Our management information system in here, a five-year service plan, and we're talking about a million, a little over a million dollars in here. We're expecting to come back to the board in August. Um, the committee in August and then September board. 
The total for the total procurements right now is about $2.4 million. The three month outlook, we have a general legal services I'll come back to later this month. We're actually looking for a three year contract. We're starting to um, ease up on optional years per FTA. So we're looking at a three year contract about $210,000 for three years. The CEO signature authority, any, all this is less than $50,000. Real-time passenger information, our Transloc, it's our bus locator app that we have, about $45,600. Our elevator services, uh, about $10,490 a, a year. And then our month-to-month, -month, we have marina space out there at $6,100. So if any of y'all own a boat, you're more than welcome to park it there for the meantime, it's empty. <laughs> I have a diesel truck. Yes, sir. Any questions? Any questions for Mr. Saldana? Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. you. Sure, Gordon can't slip you a joke every now and then. Uh, we'll have to bring him up here for a special occasion okay, so he's good. to <laughs> present to everybody. I would absolutely support having that as an agenda item, <laughs> joke of the month. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. <laughs> Should have told him to stick around. Yeah. All right, everyone. The, the board priority for this is public image and transparency. So for the, the highlights for March uh, 2022 versus 2021, uh, we had a 5% increase in our passenger trips to 222,118. Our revenue service hours increased by 1% and our revenue service miles increased by 7.6%. Here you can see a, a graph, the breakdown showing the trend through the years. And as I mentioned, our system overall it had an increase of 5%, but we're still down 47.8% compared to pre-COVID. Our fixed route system was up 3.2%, but down 49.8% compared to pre-COVID. B-line services were up 31.4% compared to last year, and now they're only down 20.3% compared to pre-COVID. Our FlexiB service is, uh, was up 52.7% and is only down 24.5% compared to pre-COVID. Our vanpool program was up 18.6% and up 30.7% compared to pre-COVID. And our rural services, which are Real and Fasano, were up 18.8%, but down 47.2% compared to pre-COVID. Now, Derek, and for the board's benefit, our, our trends that we are experiencing with uh, the reduction in ridership that we've had since the COVID situation an issue three years ago. Uh, our, our trends are pretty consistent with national trends across the nation regarding the recovery of transit nationwide. Correct, and, and most are seeing the similar things as us where the paratransit service is seeing the, the return of the ridership much quicker than the, the fixed route service. And some areas are faring worse than us. Uh, some of the rail systems are, are still struggling and such. Our system-wide year-to-date ridership by mode, we're up 9.5%, but down 53% compared to pre-COVID. Our fixed route seven is up 7.2% and down 55% compared to pre-COVID. B-line up 35.8% and down 30.4%, though that number will continue to decrease through the, through the year. FlexiB is up 75%, down 37.7%. Our Vanpool program is up 51.3% uh, compared to 2021 and 73.5% compared to pre-COVID. In our rural services, Real and Fasano are down 13.6% year-to-date and down 73.7% compared to pre-COVID. This is our first quarter cost per passenger by service mode. As you can see, our, our Vanpool program still maintains the, the cheapest per passenger and it maintained a between 940 to almost $10. Then our uh, directly operated fixed route services were the, the next. And as our ridership has increased, you can see that the cost decreased to $13.96 per, $13 per passenger. And then the, the MV operated would be the, the next. And a reminder there though, those vehicles are capped at capacity. They can only carry up to 13 passengers. So by nature, that's going to skew it a little bit but that averaged around a little over $20 per passenger. And then as you go through, you can see that the, the FlexiB service, which is a 
kind of a demand response service for Port Aransas it was the most expensive for passenger. Here's our fixed route bus on time performance. There's uh, no issues there. And during the month of March, these were the projects that were impacting our fixed route services. We had 14 or, or 32 fixed routes or 44% that were on long-term detours. This is a list of the upcoming bond projects and uh, that will be impacting our services. And there will be an additional 79 stops that will be closed as part of this. And here's our B-line service uh, metrics. The passengers per hour did increase this last month at 2.34 as the ridership continued to re return. And we saw some decreases in those uh, cancellations. That's still below the, the standard of 2.5 though. And that no issues anywhere else. The miles between road calls was at 28,000, which is way above our standard. This is our customer assistance forms. We had 10 for the month, no issues here. And this is our miles between road calls for our large bus or our Gillig fleet, which is way above our standard, so no issues there. With that, I'll take any questions that you have. Any questions for Derek? Sounds good, Derek, good job. Thank you, sir. Budget item 18, CEO report. Yes, sir. Marissa? One of, uh, one of the issues that uh, all uh, pretty much companies and entities in the United States are facing is the ability to attract and retain uh, quality workers to do the various things we need to do, and in our case, to do transportation in a very safe, efficient, and uh, secure manner. Uh, we, we have had trouble recruiting quality employees over the last several years. We've, we've implemented some, uh, some bonus programs to help the recruitment and solicitation of employees and, and have noticed that, uh, that likewise on the back end of the employment, once we get toward uh, some tenure, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, that we need to have uh, a form of retention performance uh, for our employees to uh, be able to continue and retain the quality employees that we have today. Uh, we have looked at uh, uh, crafting a retention program for existing employees at the RTA in five-year increments. So in, in, in essence, every, every fifth year of employment you would receive a retention bonus to keep you uh, happy with the RTA, keep you content with the RTA, and, and allow you to continue your your tenure with the RTA. So we're looking at amending our procurement program to implement a, a four-step uh, retention program that recognizes uh, with, a, with a cash bonus uh, five, 10, 15, and 20 years of service to the organization, and, and you must be, be in a good status with employment with the RTA to be uh, awarded these uh, amounts at these incremental times of your anniversary with the RTA. A fifteen hundred for the first five years, and at ten years you would be three thousand. At fifteen years it would be four thousand five hundred, and at twenty years you would receive. Uh, the uh, the amount of six thousand, which is incremental, thousand uh, five hundred each fifth year, as a retention bonus for your service to the RTA. And I wanted to, to mention it because I've heard various uh, board members comment of well, what are we looking to do uh, for existing employees and what kind of plan we've developed to to apply. Our workforce. If uh, if uh, I, I receive the, the general concurrence to pr continue proceeding al along these lines, under the FTA grant applications, uh, you know we have uh, we have two grants that we're eligible for that the FTA has made one grant application, and uh, 
The, the first is the, uh, the amount that is dedicated to actually uh, acquiring zero emission buses and the infrastructure and support for that. The, uh, the second is the working with the, uh, the agency to look at uh, transit support systems. We're looking to, uh, to put this together with our, our legislative consultants. Uh, we have received uh, 60 <coughs> letters of support. Go ahead. We, uh, we have received several commendations uh, regarding our outstanding metro transit system in Texas. We've received a letter from John Cornyn uh, complimenting the board and the RTA for being recognized as the best in Texas. We've received a, a, a letter of commendation from Greg Abbott, our governor, who is also recognizing our service as the outstanding transit agency, and, and even our, our local Todd Hunter with the, uh, the, on the House of Representatives sent us a letter to recognize us. And do I have those handy? These, are, these were unsolicited uh, letters and uh, I thought it was significant that uh, our senator, our governor, and our representative are, are sending us letters of commendation for our service. Jeremy, can you? Not often an agency gets uh, certificates from uh, the elected leaders of the nation, of our state and nation, to recognize the <coughs> service. Thank you. And also, upcoming events, uh, we have a, we have a busy May, and we have a, a busy June July period. The you have these in your your material. I want to recognize that on June 3rd, which is the next to the last item, we are having what our chair would like to call the strategic meeting of the RTA board. And uh, we, we captured it as a retreat, but it's a, it's a special meeting that we're going to be reviewing all the strategic items for the upcoming year and into the future. And we would like to have all the, the board members possibly uh, make it the uh, attendance for probably all of the morning and part of the early afternoon. So June 3rd. What, uh, here? What's that? Here. It'd be here at the RTA in the, the main conference room, which is right across from uh, my office in the hallway. Uh, be on the lookout for the agenda and the board items, and uh, we'll be doing that. Jorge, I have a question uh, on that one-time bonus. Uh, can you go back to that slide? Sure. Back. Uh, that is for all employees or uh, exempt, non-exempt, like what? That is all employees for years of service. Okay. And they have to be good years. You can't, you can't be on probation or having a history of problems. Got to have a good record, and you have to hit employment at five years, whether you're exempt or not exempt. Okay. Any other questions? Taking a vacation? Yes, and uh, and <laughs> after three years, because of the COVID restrictions being lifted in many countries, oh, we now have the opportunity finally to go visit my wife's family after a three-year lull. But looking forward to it, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. Any other questions for Jorge? All right. Thank you. Board Chair Report, as customary, I'll start on the left-hand side. Mr. Director Munoz, do you have anything to say? Uh, I just want to thank uh, Derek and the, other, the team and all the hard work they've done on the LONO. Uh, application. I know that it's pretty in extensive work that you all have to do, so just want to thank you all for all your hard work on that. And Rita, also on the uh, the marketing uh, thing, I think we're going to see a lot of really positive uh, 
response from the community. So just want to thank you and, and the rest of the staff and, uh, you know, just thank you for all the hard work and keep it up. Thank you so much. Director Salazar. Let's go get that money. <laughs> <laughs> Good Director work, Dominguez. everyone. Good work, everyone. Just phenomenal on all the awards and, you know, you just keep doing what you're doing. Secretary totally Allison. What's been said, and um, I'm excited to see the, uh, the results of the Route 93 and 95 as they continue to improve. As always, good job, everybody. Um, I had a chance to attend the mobility conference this past week. A lot of good learning. We made a lot of connections, met a lot of new people, saw a lot of familiar faces. So um, excited to see what the year brings. Thank you. Director Canales. Uh, just wanted to also say thank you to the staff and everybody for all your hard work. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Those awards are very impressive. We get trophies, letters, all kinds of goodies. That's very nice. Uh, goes to show how hard everybody's working. Uh, I also agree with Director Salazar. Go get that money. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you all. Director Chato. Um, I want to say congratulations to Mr. Levet and Don for, uh, for his commitment to security and the Certificate of Merit for Best Security. Um, it's wonderful to see a collaboration between agencies and see that collaboration and wonderful things can happen with that. So on behalf of the city of Robstown, um, anything we can do to assist the RTA, we are willing to do it. So, and you know, wonderful work for everybody else as well. Director Robert. Since uh, Director Skabarczyk's not here, I'll take his line. Good work, everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the judge still on? Judge, do you want to say anything? Good job. Good job, everyone, is what he typed. Okay. Great. Uh, again, I'll reiterate that. Uh, as evidenced by all the hard work by uh, the staff, I mean, we've been racking up award after award after award, and I just instructed Jorge to change the agenda to add a line item uh, right before the meeting minutes uh, to uh, have just a spot there for recognitions and awards, whether that's employee recognition or what have you. So. I, you know that that's fantastic, and that that's a tribute to everybody's hard work. And onward and up. Well, adelante, right? Adelante. All right. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. It is ten ten, and I adjourn the meeting. Okay. Yes, sir.